Ladies and gents, this is the one. So according to rival fans, Old Trafford is falling down. Even our new part owner, Sir Jim, has publicly stated that the home of Manchester United is looking a bit tired. It's not quite of the standard you would expect of Manchester United today. With all that said, Old Trafford is still the largest club football ground in the UK, with people from all over the world flocking here on a daily basis. Hello! <laughs> Evidence of this is in our recent match day vlog versus Fulham, where we met Irish fans, Danish fans, Chinese fans. Where do you come from? Oh, China. China. So go easy on me with this dodgy accent. I'm only from down the road, down the M60, M56, M6, M5. They've only really got like an hour until you, get, until you reach my house. So in part one, we took a look around the outside of Old Trafford until security stopped us. But we also took a look around the streets surrounding Old Trafford. So if you haven't seen that video, don't worry, there'll be a link at the end of this video. Oh, and there will be a part for you guys all about where a new Old Trafford could possibly be built. But right now, let's do the stadium tour, the museum tour, have a look around the mega store and grab a bite to eat in a red cafe. Before we begin, guys, I've got a bit of trivia for you. Now, this trivia can be found in the Manchester United Museum. Some of the answers to these questions will be obvious to United fans, but some of this trivia might be interesting to non-United fans, such as United, obviously, were Newton Heath, but when did they become Manchester United? Let's find out. Oh, yes, 1902. They moved to Old Trafford in... 1910, of course. Most United appearances? Oh yes, it's Giggsy with a whopping 963. Fergie started managing United in the 86-87 season. Now it is quite interesting because if you go to the United Museum, it's got the record attendance for Manchester United at Old Trafford as to being 76,098 people which was set in 2007 versus Blackburn Rovers but nowhere in the museum could I see in general at Old Trafford is higher than that and the two teams who helped set that record are very surprising can you guess in the comments below which match was the highest attended match in Old Trafford history I'll give you a few seconds teams you would never probably guess well one of them a big club Wolverhampton Wanderers played Grimsby Town in the FA Cup semi-final in 1939 and they set the record attendance at Old Trafford of 76,962 so a little over that record set by United in 2007 now I'm going to leave you for a moment guys with a few more facts and I'll catch up with you inside Old Trafford Don't worry guys, if you saw that time lapse, we've not completely bypassed the museum. We're gonna do the tour after the stadium tour, but you've got to pass through the Manchester United Museum to start the stadium tour. Now the stadium tour, as you can see, will start in the Sir Alex Ferguson stand. That's the North stand for our slightly older viewers. Now, as you can see from this point, you've got a really good view of the whole stadium and in particular, the pitch. Next, you'll go through, which I think is called a concourse area. I think that's what they call it. It's basically where on match day, you're going to have a few points, maybe a bite to eat and go and have a wee in the toilets. It's a no frill sort of area that pretty much looks the same throughout the ground. As you can 
see on that sign, guys. You can have liquor, just no intoxicating liquor. Right, so guys, this is where visually impaired people go. They have like earphones and stuff. Obviously this is where people in wheelchairs go. You've got the away fans over here, and then you've got safe standing, safe standing for the home fans up there, which is where I keep going on about, which is my favorite place to sit, not the Stretford End, as much as I love the Stretford End. Now we're off to the changing rooms. Where are we going now? On the way to the changing rooms, you'll pass the old tunnel. Now, apparently this is the oldest part of the stadium. When the stadium was bombed in World War II and United had to go and play at Main Road, this tunnel survived it all. It's the most indestructible tunnel, I think, in all of English football. But on the tunnel, you'll see, I got a little bit aroused when I saw my good old mate, Archibald Leach, that Scottish architect, his picture is on the wall, obviously, to reminisce about the fact that he designed the original Old Trafford. Thank you. This one should be open. So the Manchester United change room has changed loads over the years, and in particular, over the last few years, it's actually pretty much doubled in size. You can see where that United badge is on the floor. That's basically where the old wall was, where the old changing room ended. Now, you'll get taken around, obviously, the Manchester United changing room, but on the tour, they don't actually take you to the away dressing room, which is a shame. Normally, when we do all these stadium tours on the channel, we have a little nose at the away changing room and normally slag it off because it's normally a bit rough. But obviously, they have to meet regulations, Premier League standards, Champions League standards and so on. So the tour guy did say that it's pretty much the same, minus the LEDs and the liquor paint and stuff. Uh, I don't know if that is the case. There is slight propaganda on the tour. It's like when you go for a tour around North Korea, they take you to all the pretty bits. Obviously, this tour is nothing like a tour around North Korea. But what I'm trying to say is they'll take you to the pretty parts of the stadium and rightfully kind of keep hidden the maybe not so pretty parts which I enjoy looking at normally when we do stadium tours and stuff but unfortunately you don't get the chance at Old Trafford. So here we go the guys sat in captain Bruno's seat the main man I am a little bit critical of Bruno I must admit but um, as a filminist we beat Forrest last night beautiful free kick by Bruno off the head of Casemiro nice. I think I speak on behalf of all United fans when I say this I can stay there. Just try and do it just once, start the game right, OK? And I know it's against your nature. I know you like to make us suffer. But nice to score an early goal, you know what I mean? Yeah, you're the first to score in the early parts of the game since, I don't know, it's Norman Whiteside, I think. So, where the badge is, is where the change room used to finish. It used to be tiny. As you can see, this is where each team, home and away, will come out of the changing room and to the tunnel. Now, the Manchester United tunnel, the new tunnel, I say new tunnel, they've been using it for years, is huge. Partly due to getting kind of vehicles in and out of the ground, not just emergency vehicles. Remember, um, part of the travesty with Hillsborough was the fact that I think only one ambulance managed to make its way onto the pitch. Obviously, United have got such a huge tunnel, they can also get like machinery and stuff um, for actually doing the pitch through there the roof actually lifts up now in this tunnel you can also see that's where they do interviews and if you're thinking oh they're going to be a bit free a bit chilly doing those interviews they've got a heater on the wall so it's all good come on united come on Normally it's kids that are first to make their way through the tunnel uh, towards the Old Trafford pitch. But, they, you know, it was during school time and old Roy managed to get ahead of the game as we made our way through the tunnel listening to This Is The One. You can see that 
you are below pitch level as you walk around the ground. Now, you might think when you watch on TV, oh, to be front row at Old Trafford is the best view. It's really not. You're really low. You're kind of below what's happening on the pitch. But that said, the atmosphere is fantastic. And as you make your way around the ground, especially from that low level, you see what an absolute monster Old Trafford is. And even though it's an old ground, been here since 1910 people often make fun of it but it really is still striking to this day so if you haven't been to Old Trafford regardless of whether you're a United fan or not it is definitely breathtaking I'm not saying it's the most fancy I'm not saying it's the most impressive like for example a Tottenham Hotspur Stadium but the sheer size in itself is massive literally massive so ladies and gents where I'm currently sat is Eric Ten Hag's seat this is the pressure seat. This is the seat where the decisions are made, like putting Lindelof at left back. So who named Old Trafford the Theatre of Dreams? Sir Bobby Charlton, of course. That's known as a TV gantry. And that's where the main commentators, the likes of Peter Drury and co commentators, that's where they would be uh, on covering the game. And the TV studios over there, that's where the pundits would be. That 100 years thing in the floor is actually a time capsule that was put there in 2010. It's obviously got kind of programs, I think a program from 1968, various memorabilia things from United's history. Now, as you head towards the press conference room, this is sort of the one and only area you can't really film or take photos in. That's because Manchester United make money selling pictures of you sat behind that desk having interviews, etc. Normally, in most grounds, they use it as an opportunity for you guys just to take pictures on your phone, but not United. They're getting in the money. Fair play to them. You would like your photos taken behind the desk. Stay sat down for me. And if not, if you want to exit to my left now, that'd be absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Now, as we meet up in this area, this is basically the end of the tour, guys, which will lead you into the mega store. Now, as we head into the mega store, this is a mega store. This is a store we're always critical of on Rise Football Paradise, despite not actually physically filming a video here. I did on the sly. We always bad mouth the Man United Club shop but is it as bad as I make out honestly it's not that bad it looks a little bit more like a department store at first glance you might think Christ I'm in Debenhams or I'm in John Lewis or something like that it is very un football club like and that's my problem with it you don't have those novelty quirky items that essentially Man United were the first to have they paved the way on commercialization you had Fred the Red as a result of branding appealing to kids now my memories of the mega store back in the day were awesome i used to buy my little my little corinthian figures like i've got here i've got eric Cantona of his collar up i've got loads of memories of buying all kinds of quirky items i know i was a kid back then and i loved all the novelty items but i still love the novelty items now and if, as you look round the manchester united shop my biggest criticism is it's basically like an adidas mega store they've got sponsorships with like remington selling 70 pound hair dryers with a manchester united badge on really isn't for me but maybe that's what a lot of the fan base like now so who am i to judge but after going to all these different stadiums and visiting each and every one, especially Premier League clubs, visiting their club shops as we compare it to our arch rivals of Liverpool, Liverpool was, you know, speaking neutrally, is probably one of the best club shops I've been to. The size of it is massive, like Manchester United's, but it's full of loads of those unique quirky items we always reminisce about. Right then guys, so every time we visit a Premier League stadium, remember, there's one rule, we gotta buy something from the club shop. And if you're interested in what I bought from the United Mega Store, I did a sneaky bit of filming, even though I wasn't supposed to, check out part three of this video series when we look at where New Trafford could be built, because I'm gonna reveal what we bought in that video. 
So the stadium tour was decent. Do you know what? Everyone has been really friendly besides the security guard. He's only doing his job. I'm not knocking him. But right now, we're going to get back to that museum, the museum we had to pass through to start the stadium tour. And then we're going to have a quick... Do you know what, actually? I'm absolutely bloody starving. Let's get to the Red Cafe first. One star, food hygiene rating and all. I don't know if that applies to the Red Cafe. Every time I've been there, the food has been delightful. We're going to get to the Red Cafe and then we're going to check out the museum. Red Cafe time. Let's go. to the red cafe guys now initially it's got that kind of american diner feel maybe that's what the glazers love let's not be rude the the red cafe has pretty much been like this for years i like it it's charming i'm not into like fine dining and posh kind of uh interiors and stuff it does the job but at first glance you will be somewhat impressed with all the seating you've got players names and numbers on the backs of chairs a really nice uh, visual when you come into the Red Cafe. You look round, you can see legends like Teddy Sheringham, Paul Scholes, Rude Van Nisselrooy, Cristiano Ronaldo and George Best, and of course the biggest legend of them all, Juan Mata. But as a matter of fact, I'm always very positive about the Red Cafe. For me, it's an incredible, uh, everything I've ordered over the years at the Red Cafe has tasted incredible. I would genuinely take one of those pizzas over a Domino's, over a Pizza Hut, even over a bloody Papa John's. I love the Red Cafe Meat Feast Pizza. If you look at the menu, you can kind of see that American diner feel. You've got the chips, your burgers. Oh, you make sure you get that Coke in. Where's my bloody Coke? There it is. That's it. Great shot of the Coke there, Roy. Oh, and the pizza as well. Look at that. Fantastic. Beautiful. So as we leave the Red Cafe, fortunately with my full belly, the museum is right outside the Red Cafe. So we head into the museum and it is absolutely overwhelming in a good way. There's so much on the wall, so much to, to see. Your eyes are literally doing backflips. It's an incredible museum and I highly recommend, even if you massively hate Man United, to check out the Manchester United Museum. We went to the Liverpool Museum again. Probably one of my least favourite clubs, as much as we try and be neutral on the channel. But I love the Liverpool Museum, I love the Arsenal Museum and the Manchester United Museum. As much as we badmouth United about so many different things, the museum is incredible. So check it out, guys. There's literally so much to see. What I love about it is it caters to all fans. You've got kids, you've got people who don't necessarily know much about United. You've got trivia on the wall, stuff for people to learn, big time Man United fans. There's also loads to reminisce about. So it's a win-win for everyone visiting the United Museum. So did you know that Fred the Red made his debut on the final game of the 93-94 season? But he wasn't the only mascot in Man United's history. Union, the goat, real life goat, back in 1909. I do think fans from other clubs don't fully appreciate how good Brian Robson was. You've got a whole room here dedicated to Captain Marvel. That's kind of a forgotten era, isn't it? Like the late 80s. Obviously, people remember the hooliganism and stuff. But pre-Premier League and then sort of after like the 70s, 60s, 70s and stuff, which people often regard as like a good a glory time for football. That forgotten era when English football was in ruin because of like the Heisel disaster, the Bradford disaster, Hillsborough and stuff. Captain Marvel, Brian Robson. <laughs> I love the fact that he's got a whole room dedicated to him at the museum. David Beckham's favourite player growing up. So obviously we couldn't look at the Munich Memorial Tunnel outside. Got told off for filming, but it's a really nice tribute inside the museum. 
for those unaware of that disaster that happened in Munich on February the 6th of 1958. Everything you need to know is in this museum. You've got a roll of honour, survivors, obviously we know there's survivors most famously being Sir Matt Busby, Bobby Charlton, etc. Uh, but what's frustrating for United fans was the fact that they tried to take off numerous times prior to the crash. It just wouldn't happen nowadays, would it? it was, different times back then. Not only was it a disaster for Man United, it was a disaster for the England national team. If you think of some of those players who died in the Munich air disaster, they'd have been playing for England in the 1958 World Cup in Sweden. England may well have won the World Cup prior to 66, who knows? And also Real Madrid obviously being the first team to win five Champions Leagues. Could United have done a similar thing? Again, who knows? Some of these items were rescued from the plane wreck, like Duncan Edwards, his hold all, his actual bag, recovered from that disaster in 1958. It's crazy. Some of the items in here, I mean, it's a sad thing, but it's nice that we can celebrate the players who lost their lives playing for Manchester United. Can we also just mention how good the Man United Calypso is? Cue the music. Manchester, Manchester United. So as most of you know already, Manchester United was formed in 1878 as Newton Heath, the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway Cricket and Football Club. Quite a mouthful. They did play in green and yellow halves. That is somewhat disputed because people are using black and white pictures as reference and they're thinking now that that yellow might have actually been white. But we all love that green and yellow kit, don't we? The, the one from the early 90s, the throwback one. So we can mention Archibald Leach once again. The ground was originally going to be a 100,000 seater stadium. Kind of money dried up a little bit. It ended up being like 80,000. And the very first game to be played here was indeed 114 years ago in 1910 versus our arch rivals, Liverpool. Now, unfortunately, Liverpool won this game for free. Sign of things to come? I don't know. So guys, the Manchester United Museum, out of all the museums we've been to, is without doubt the biggest, which is kind of inevitable, being one of the biggest clubs. The second biggest museum would probably be Liverpool's, understandably. The second biggest club, I'm bantering Liverpool fans. So as we make our way down the steps now, this is basically all about kits. Now we love retro kits on Noise Football Paradise. And you can kind of feel what some of the old kits felt like. We've got this goalie shirt. I think it was the away goalie shirt from possibly 96, 97. We've got that in Royce Football Paradise, the infamous grey, and this one here, which is a bit like that QPR away one we bought the other day, a bit like a rugby top. The famous green and gold shirts were worn between 1893 and 1896. However, photographs suggest that this team had moved away from halves and were now wearing green shirts with a gold trim, like this. We don't know, that's the problem with black and white photographs. But United have had some glorious kits over the years. Obviously I've got the first Premier League season one with the laces. That will set you back a fair whack from uh, classic football shirts. So over here, we've got the shirt Rooney wore on his debut against Fenerbahce when he scored a hat-trick. But, who remembers that he felt somewhat restricted in his kit and he actually ripped the collar behind him. An equally famous shirt, the Eric Cantona Kung Fu Kick shirt, the black shirt, the one I've actually got on underneath right now. Speaking of infamous kits, over there in the distance, we mention it all the time on the channel, especially when we were at Southampton the other week, the grey kit, but enough said about that. Straightforward, the players don't like the grey strip, simply that. The grey kit had been launched last summer, yet the team hadn't won a single Premiership game in it. Do you think they should dump their grey kit? No. Oh, it's a terrible kit, I'd never buy it. Rubbish, the grey kit, just dump that. What do you think they should do with the kit? Get rid of it, burn it. <laughs> Can literally get lost here there's just so much to look at you've got Kino shirts over here you've got basically memorabilia from some of united's biggest players over the years bobby charlton mark hughes the king eric Cantona. 
Man United fans, that European Cup final in 99 would be probably their greatest ever United match. For me, obviously, that was amazing. I loved the FA Cup semi-final at Villa Park versus Arsenal. At the time, I've said it before, I bloody hated Arsenal. Take it as a compliment though, Arsenal Lingers Arsenal were incredible. This match had everything. Roy Keane was sent off, Michael saved a penalty, Patrick Vieira just gave the ball on the halfway line. This man right here, Ryan Giggs, who didn't even start the match, people forget that. He came on as a sub. Lee Dixon has been quoted, quoted as saying he absolutely shit himself when Giggs came on. Here we go. Had to top it all off. The greatest celebration of all time. The hairy chest out. Brings hairs on my chest. Love that game. Fantastic. And I love that shirt as well, I don't know what the rip's, what's the rip all about? Crazy, this was a match in 1999, this was Roy Keane's shirt and a scuffle happened which basically saw ex-Man United player scuffle with Roy Keane. Maybe it was over that holding midfielder spot in the mid-90s. It went, obviously went to Inter Milan, came back, went to uh, Liverpool and he ripped Keane's shirt, Itsy. He's a bit like Michael Owen, it's, he's kind of tarnished any kind of um, fondness amongst United fans from going to Liverpool, similar to how Michael Owen was a Liverpool, would have been a Liverpool legend, but obviously finished up at United. So then guys, I'm just finishing up editing part two of the Old Trafford series, tour, and I've just realised I've not done a bit of an outro, a bit of a conclusion to the video. So I hope you've enjoyed the stadium tour, the museum, the Red Cafe and the Mega Store. We're two thirds of the way in, so make sure if you're not already, subscribe, because hopefully... Following on from this video will be part three, maybe even today on the same day. Remember, we're going to be doing a weekly live stream from this week as well, every Wednesday, possibly at 8 p.m. So check that one out as well. We'll get your questions ready in the comments below or even just get them ready because it's going to be good. But yeah, I'm absolutely knackered. So I'm going to go now. The video is long enough and I'll see you in part three of this series. Oh, yes, there's some videos around me here if you are new to the channel, check out those videos and I'll see you in one of those bloody videos.